So, so, it's been, so it's been a long haul. I've been uh, dealing with this, this construct called cultural disorientation from almost from the beginning because I was trying to understand what's wrong with us. What is this situation that I'm observing every day in our community? Uh, and so in uh, 1980, uh, I published this paper called the Psychology of Oppression. And actually it was written in about 1977. And I submitted it to the Journal of Black Studies and they had a notorious for their backlog. So it was about a three year backlog and just slugged their way through the system to get to, get to the printing press. And Dr. Malefi Asante, who was the editor at that time, maybe still, still be the editor, and he contacted me and told me he was publishing a book. Uh, and he wanted, he would like to give me the offer of having my article included in his book, and it would get to press sooner than way for the journal. And so I, so I gave him a nod, yes, for that. And so it came out in 1980, three years after it was uh, tenured. Mm -hmm. And in that, in that article, I, excuse me, introduced this construct that I have been struggling with since that time, trying to expand upon it, uh, hone it, you know, it's like a piece of clay, you know, you're working with it and working with it. And either it showed how intellectually and I was, or I am. <laughs> um, it was quite a complex construct that I'm dealing with, and so, so it continues to evolve and transform and transform me in this process of trying to better understand uh, at least my concept of what's wrong with African people uh, living in this unique circumstance of living under Caucasian domination, being born in it, and negotiate their life through. And they have to find the whole social cultural reality in which you live and breathe. Uh, and that's a circumstance, as you'll see in this presentation, that sometimes we tend to overlook, you know. And it's like, it's like the, the 90,000 pound elephant in the room. And it's as invisible as hell because of our psychological defensiveness, what it has done to us, and we just ignore it. Uh, but it impacts everything that we do. Uh, so, and you know my story, I mean, most people in ABC, you know there are a lot of uh, new students. Yeah, myself, Wade, handful of others, us, you know, we, we came into this, this, uh, this field at a time when revolutionary thought was taking place. We were trying to redefine this thing, so we asked Wade to try our course of study in such a way that it was consistent with this African-centered psychology construct that we were building. Uh, as a community of black psychologists. And so, uh, so I, I, my entire career is about trying to understand this phenomenon called the psychology of black people and the nature of this broader psychosocial cultural universe that we inhabit. And given the fact that Caucasians seem to dominate this sphere of us, we have to study them too. <laughs> we're going to understand our predicament and we got to understand who and what we're dealing with. And that's one of those other books that are on the, on the drawing board that I'm, I'm, I'm working on. Uh, but what I found in my study is that we're black people, and certainly we black psychologists, we just don't seem to understand black people, ourselves as African people, because of this unique circumstance we have we've been removed from Africa, you know, and I mean, the great kidnapping and the, all the trauma that was associated with that and the lingering trauma that continues to be associated with it. But we really don't seem to understand that as psychologists. We struggle with, with, with myopic aspects of it, but it seems the overall process continues to escape psychological analysis as a general rule among black psychologists. But now that we seem to understand Caucasian people, as I said, the people who classify themselves as white, and their white supremacy domination of nation. And certainly, as I indicated, you don't seem to understand this oppression process, this, this psychological prison that they have us in that seems to dictate our very being as uh, black people. So again, my work has been geared toward trying to understand and comp comprehend and struggle with this issue, uh, interrogating it intellectually throughout my career. 
And there are three significant words that are associated with my thinking. Uh, some of you have lived there, personality in America, the 92, and of course the Cultural Orientation book. I have a few copies that are brought with me, uh, just a few, and they are $15 in the back on the side table. Uh, and the, the textbook on uh, African Black Psychology that some of you all are familiar with, I call it the Red Book. Uh, and in that, I, I, you can see my thinking continually evolving on this construct of cultural disorientation uh, and, and, uh, and the elaborate, the complex nature of it, put it that way. Now, what, it's just, a, just some common terms, so we have a common understanding of where, where I'm coming from. Uh, I call this, this mental health, I call it an African-centered mental health construct, post disorientation. It represents the African-centered paradigm for understanding the psychology of black oppression. It is proposed as representing, I call it, basic African or black personality or mental disorder. And it's applicable to pan-African communities living under Caucasian or European and Eurasian white supremacist domination and racism. CM, or call that the acronym we use for it. CM is like, oh boy. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm getting an echo from it when I speak. Oh. <laughs> we don't hear you. Pardon me? We don't hear you. Okay. Uh, that it, it, makes it, it makes it bearable for us you know, to, to cope with. Uh, a brilliant colleague of ours, the late Dr. Amos Wilson, he, 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 he made this, he, he made this, this, many of his, among his many brilliant insights. He said that white domination requires black insanity. It requires it. It demands it. And it can't thrive in the absence of black insanity. <laughs> you know, to uphold it, you see, to maintain this domination state. And that's really what we're, we're articulating in this cultural disorientation construct. We're talking about how they, what is the nature of this black insanity that they have normalized in their society, <laughs> you see. And they normalize it so much that we're almost inoculated, you know, to, to uh, recognizing it. And so it's a very complex phenomenon. So uh, this paradigm ultimately challenges the very nature of the foundation of the psychological distortion characterizing normative psychological life in America. For we the oppressed and the oppressor, the Caucasians, their psychology. By cultural disorientation, I generally mean uh, black people internalizing a Eurocentric consciousness as their normal psychological orientation and a nature that we internalize their value system, their way of construing reality as our normal, natural way of evaluating and construing reality. Their way. We come under the auspices of their institutions. Uh, and the cultural oppression process there you see, therefore you see, is intricately related to cultural misorientation. It brings it into being. It creates cultural misorientation in black people. And what they do, their institutions of European society, of course, operate to, to, uh, to psychologically oppress African people. And one of the processes that they use is miseducation. You know, miseducation, our brainwashing, you know, that of our people. So it's the acquisition of knowledge uh, through the Eurocentric prism of uh, reality. That is, the European worldview, their cultural reality for understanding the functioning of African people and everybody else in the world. The, in, the, in the new, the, the second edition, the revised edition, that the first had five chapters, I think, in that first edition, the black edition there. And there. So it expands to about uh, nine chapters, and some are repeating, just updating those chapters, and then when I introduce some new ones, and I'll talk about the, the new chapters that have been added and, what, and what they, what, how they affect my thinking in that regard. Uh, and I, asked, I think I've asked the new chapters. Uh, in this first chapter, the first uh, chapter, So, so I'll 
that was the uh, with my usual loud voice. But the uh, the what I felt was lacking in the first edition, I didn't. I, I, the, the construct relies on understanding oppression, and all of my works speak to that issue. And so I didn't want to be so redundant, since I assume that there's a cumulative process in my writing. And if people are aware of that, then they can see that that uh, that that process was sort of implied. But in this version, I want to spell it out. So I need to I need to make sure that the reader understands the context. You know, as as uh, as complicated as it is to talk about, how does American society use this institutions to control the mind frame of black people? control our thoughts, and I talk about the institutional stat strategies that are used to do that for this education, because I have a diagram somewhere in, the, in this process, and I'll let, it, let that speak for itself when I get there. The, the fourth one is what I call the new, new addition to the second edition. Is the, the, I call them CM complexes. Are these, these just, there are certain, certain behaviors in our everyday behaviors that we observe in black people that they are so common and they're so commonly common in their occurrence that you can't miss the CM implications in those behaviors. I call them concentrated pockets of CM energy. And so I call them these complexes. And, and there are about six of them that I, I identify. But it's not, it's not in all inclusive. There could be others that should be added. All of my thinking is evolving. I invite you to, you know, to work with it, to take it from me, and, Take it wherever you can take it, you know. As I told you, you know, my, the clock is ticking on me, so, so we're going to try to get it all, get as much out of me that I can while I'm still walking on top of the earth. And then I'm going to leave it. The day is yours. <laughs> you, do, you see what you can do with it. And then you pass it on, of course. And we, it's chemical, knowledge is cumulative inter intergenerational. And if we see it that way, we understand that, that we continue this discussion, you know, long after we've gone that opportunity. Uh, but the, uh, the complex is, you know, religion, names, hair, you know, N-word, you know, hypersensitivity, you know, you know, we, you know we, that's what oppression, that's what, that's how oppression, this corporate orientation manifests itself in our people, you know, through all these distortions of what it means to be an African person and how we express it, these contortions of, of our naturalness, you know, under this condition of, of oppression. Uh, the, 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 the fifth chapter that is, is new, that I was in, in the, in the uh, about, I don't know, 10 years ago in Chicago, in about, in the, the, the Center for Institute Studies got a grant to do something, to look at lingering effects of slavery uh, and among contemporary you know, Africans in America. And they invited me, Asa Wade, to deal with the psychological aspect. They had people from all disciplines you know, that are working on this project. And what I did, I focused on taking the CM construct and showing how these other constructs that were being introduced fall under the rubric of cosmic orientation. That that's how they really achieved their fuller explanation for, for the viability among our people. What is called post-traumatic slavery disorders, the post-traumatic slave syndrome, etc. Uh, this trauma, this notion about understanding this, this chronic trauma and our people and how it is lingered even today in all these disguised fashions that we don't, we don't understand how to articulate it, but it's as dominant in our, in our manifestations as black people. As, as, as ever. So that's what that chapter is about. Uh, Toward acceptability and prevalence, that's a new twist on an old chapter where I try to point out more of how they normalize it, how the institution of American society actually normalize this craziness in black people in such a way you know you can have it. I mean, you can have somebody like Michael Jackson, you know, he's so demonstrative, you know, it's hard to admit, you know, the late Michael Jackson. I mean, up there disfiguring himself. I mean, to, I mean, just did a whole disfiguration of himself. I mean, just a nut job. You know, right there in, on the broad stage of America. We could all see it. I mean, this wasn't something concealed with it. I mean, he did it. We knew him for the, as a child. We knew, the, we knew the African Michael. And then we knew this, I don't want to be African Michael. <laughs> And we saw all the various phases of it. I don't, not, not good enough, not good enough, not, in other words, not far enough American, not far enough, not far enough, you know. And let's, let's keep working on it, you know, and whatever. But we saw this 
This psychopathology demonstrated before our eyes over time. And you didn't have any psychologists there. Hey, we need to understand this for now. Everybody treat like, well, that's my, I guess they said, that's Michael. You know, that's what that money does for you. So we come up with some simplistic way of articulating that. But here it is, I mean, a bold nut job being demonstrated before the eye, the innocent eyes of black children. And here it is, and then we wonder, why wow, children are so crazy? You know, 15 ever overdose, I was at somebody's house, uh, somewhere, uh, somebody told me about, and at the house they were showing off their new place, and took them in their children's bedroom, they got a life-size picture of Michael Jackson up there. One of them versions other than the, the black looking one. <laughs> you know? uh, and, uh, I mean life-size in the bedroom. Now what, what kind of crazy message are you sending to, to an African child, you know, that this is a symbol of success and so on and so forth and what have you. But we, you know, we, we overlook those guys. It's easy to overlook because they normalize it. That's, that's the power they use. They normalize this stuff. Make us think that black crazy is the way the world is. <laughs> Nothing y'all can do about it. That's it. <laughs> Just suck it up and continue to be crazy and get crazier. You know. And what happened? Uh, so that's what I'm dealing with there, the purpose and acceptability of it, how the, how the skew is just getting, just getting even worse as we move through the you know, more contemporary times, you know, and whatever. See, on the plantation, we had, we had a stimulus of our the oppressor, bold stimulus. So it's kind of hard to be totally ignore him, ignore it, you see, um, you know, in that context. So we would probably have more consciousness about white supremacy domination on the plantation. We just didn't have the time to engage in proactive struggle because we were too busy trying to what? Just survive day to day, moment to moment, and so on and so forth. So it shows you the real genius uh, and the resiliency of African people that those who were able to get you out some space for proactive uh, thinking and consideration, uh, even in the midst of this life and death struggle, moment to moment, this chronic uh, stress, you know, traumatizing stress, this terrorism, you know, that we had to. That we have to live on. So the rest of them are pretty much in the, the same way we'll be talking about it, that is with implications. Uh, so in this first chapter, and what I and what I want to emphasize is this notion of the um, what I call European culture reality. The culture reality that it sort of overlays the American social societal order. In other words, the European value system, their philosophy of life, it's all it's it's on television, they message it in everything. It's in, it's in the curriculum of education. You know, it's everywhere, as other people have alluded to in their various presentations, you know, during this week. It is everywhere. It's in the, it's like in the air. <laughs> you know, we breathe it, you know, without even thinking, it's there. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a stench that we've gotten so, that we've adapted to. And it doesn't even stink anymore, you see. It doesn't even stink anymore. And it's this repugnant, and punching, as you can imagine, <laughs> but, now, but we, have, we, have, we, have, we have normalized it, you know, and whatever. Uh, and so, so, the, so I just put a, a, a great emphasis on looking at this whole process of cultural oppression, which I do in those earlier works that I mentioned to you. But I think I wanted to bring it, bring it composite in this analysis so that you got everything you need to follow the analysis in that particular manuscript uh, without having to consult the others. Uh, uh, and that's just background for the understanding of psychological oppression, given the context. Of course, we know the great kidnapping, you know, and our people were stolen out of Africa, brought here. And I think what they normalize too, again, is the abject brutality that our people have to experience. I mean, these people treated our people, you know, far and expressive like shit. And we, we sort of normalize that. We accept, you know, we, we, we find, I mean, we find the most grotesque stuff, you know, it's like digestible. <laughs> they make it digestible. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they treated us, I mean, they were, they dogged our people, you know. And we, and we, and we, and, you know, and, like, and we, we just read about it, you know, like reading about fairyland or something. It's so remote, it's so abstract from us. But our children, we teach the history to our children. They can't even get a real sense of the history. Well, first of all, we don't teach the true history. You know, can you imagine? Yeah, I know I'm skipping about, but that's me at my age now. But, but you know, uh, can you imagine what we talk about? Black boys and have all these comments about black boys, and 
what we need to do to make black men and so on and so forth. Can you imagine what, what the simple thing is if you just taught black boys their true damn history? There were black men in our history who stood up. They don't know a damn thing about them. You know that they just got a movie out about Matt Turner. But there are people who broke victorious. I mean, they were like John Jock Desilene. They don't know anything about him. Marcus Garvey may have just heard the name. But they don't know that there were black men who were men. They don't have to come up with no imaginary idea of a man. Hell, that was black men in our history. But if you don't teach our boys about it, they ignorant. They don't know what a man is supposed to be because they don't have no image of one who's fighting against the oppression of, of African people. They don't have one. They got some who caught up in various kinds of confusion, like the ones that we have, and they just, we, it's all complex on oppression, as you will see. So we gonna have a little bit of the good, and a little bit of the bad, a little bit of the same, a little bit of the crazy, you know, all that's all mixed up in there, because cultural orientation comes in different intensities, okay, and what have you. But the, but the point of it is, is that there have always been black men and women who said, hell no. But our children don't know about it. They teach them about the ones that they stamp approval on. So you know, they got to be crazy. <laughs> you know, if they're gonna stamp approval on them. So that's the ones who are folded into the curriculum that our children get on a regular diet, you see, of black insanity as the normative way or the way that the standard for how black people should behave. And that's the simple thing that we, I mean, in Chicago, they had a movement at one time about Africanizing the curriculum of the public school system. You got a school system with 60 some percent black people, and we're gonna sit there and just let them just keep dope, overdosing us on white supremacy? You know, in the case. And most of the children in the system are black children. We gotta put on with that. That's what responsible parenting is. You say, hell no, we start our own. That's really what we have to do anyway. That's what God would try to get us to do. You know, whatever. You can't depend on anybody to educate you anyway. But the point of it is, they take your tax money and use your tax money to support your oppression. You know, and tell you to shut up, don't say nothing about it. Don't, you know, we, we push in diversity. Diversity means steal us, them, you know. Steal them, that's what it means. We still on top, you know. Not gonna rearrange, not gonna rearrange the order of power. You know, y'all can sit in the room, you know, but shut the leave up. But again, I'm saying, but it's not, look at the outcome of our children. Look at the outcome. And we run around wringing our hands trying to call somebody with a PhD from Harvard or Stanford to come and help us save our children. But a, the common sense approach, stop teaching them bullshit. Stop teaching them white supremacy stuff. You know, it's like you get out what you what? Put in. So we let somebody else put it in, put bullshit in. And we get gangbangers all over our street. War on each other. And the white folks come to break up the wall. The real, the real enemy <laughs> come and they're gonna be the peacemaker. <laughs> you know I mean, look at the way they up turn the reality upside down on our people. Because of this oppression. Because of what I argue is this cultural misorientation. So there are these institutions in this society. Uh, I'm trying to get this one on slide just so you all. You know, we waiting in the to take other people to talk about. You know, Lennon and other people, I think she's in here, talk about these differences in how African people construe the world and reality versus how, you know, African Europeans construe the world and reality. And they construe it quite differently. And it leads to different outcomes and consequences, you know, for people based upon which one is dominant, you know, in the lives of African people. And this is an old classic worldview contrasting paradigm looking at some of the principles and values that characterize the European worldview versus the African worldview. And what, it's, it, uh, what we're trying to show here is there's a constant psychodynamic or dialectic going on in the minds of black people all the time. Because this is, these are the issues, these are contrasting issues, and issues in many cases. They're uh, walling our head. But we, we don't, you know, we have a sort of, what a, you know, intuitive sense of, you know, this is me, this is more natural me. But we can all reinforcement for the stuff that's not me, <laughs> you see? And so the stuff that's not me, what, gets stronger. It's an overlay over what's naturally me. You know, and it's like putting weights on. I keep adding weights on by reinforcing it, you know, and supporting it in the institutional system of American society. And so, I mean, so they, they're able to, 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 to do that. So, again, I'm just emphasizing that, 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 that uh, 
Cultural oppression is the foundation again for, for a culture of disorientation. Um, and I was already pretty much summarized that. So all institutions in society, that's what they do. We, you can't trust any institution created out of Eurocentric reality to affirm black people. You know, like someone said last night, the individual's not picking on anybody, but when we were having a Yambangi, and one of the sisters said, but we need allies. You know, the white people, we need, they, they're our allies. Don't we need allies? Allies for what? What, what? what are whites going to do for blacks? Uh, or what do they demonstrate that they do for blacks as a collective? They oppress us. <laughs> that's what, that's the track record. So what else do they have to offer? You don't know of any other instance where the white collective has offered anything to black people other than maintaining the status quo of the oppression of the African people. Century, the that is a fact. I mean, we have, in other words, it's like we have to go concoct up some wild thinking. They even try to turn it in it. They say, well, let's make some alternative to what we know as a constant reality in our experiences as African people in America. So, so they do it through, they use all, you know, we used to sit up in undergraduate school and in those learning, psychology learning class, whatever, they talk about conditioning. They talk about how they, how they work on us. And we don't, even, we don't even know how to make a connection. But they're not going to teach us the connection, but they, those principles work, because we are an example of it working. They just do it on a what? On a mass scale, on an institutional scale. That's all. They don't walk around and take no one black person, put them in a little cage and do that. <laughs> they, they, they create a reinforcement system that deals with, that operates through an institutional structure. And it works. You, got, you, 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 can, you, can, you can what? Mass produce craziness. <laughs> Which is what they in fact do through the institution of American society. So, you know, uh, Dr. Bobby Wright is always saying, he said, if you find yourself doing something, when you're doing something, you find that Caucasians start agreeing with you. He said, at the very least, he said, I'm not saying stop, you know, aborting, but pause and reflect on it. Because <laughs> you have no experience of them endorsing and embracing anything that does not maintain the status quo of white domination. So if they stand, they rally behind you, so let's put you on TV, let's make you an example. You know, you said, you know, how they do these, do how they can always go find a black once they give them a, some kind of recognition and they, how do you do that? They have no barriers in America. Anybody, you just work hard and you know, yeah. and, they, and they put them on the next station. So we, so they broadcast that messaging all over to reinforce the already the existing state of oppression in black people. That you can't do a damn thing without white people. You can't accomplish nothing. You ain't worth nothing without white people. That's what, see, that's what the message is saying. Always been that way and always what? Will be that way. That's what they tell us. <laughs> so if, if you think of another way, wake up because you're having a nightmare. <laughs> you're having a nightmare. <laughs> you got to get up. Be scared of your own thought. <laughs> Erase that out of my mind. <laughs> That, uh, that turned to that. So they control the resources. I mean, they got this thing down there. We should always be careful, not you know making light of white people. You know, we like to, you know, we this bravado. You know, we get caught up in you know the the big. You know, when we talk about the black manhood thing, we always think manhood is about what fighting and muscles and all that stuff. And they can have a little old whip skink or Caucasian sitting at a machine and wipe your ass out. You know, and you'll be talking, it's the muscles that are gonna, gonna do it. Yeah, these, <laughs> these are the real, this is the real muscle, you see. You know, thinking, cognition, of course we're not saying muscles, you know, is not important. But we break it every damn thing. You know, we just get big and strong enough and bad enough, we can go back down there. You know, Marcus Garvey says, be serious, you gotta create institutions to go to war with institutions. You ain't gonna have no individual out there with a spear or a tummy gun. And he's gonna take on the white collective. That's a losing, that's a losing proposition from the start. You know, a young brother in the other day tell me, we tell, you know, he don't know the one brother got up and talked about, we got action, we gotta have some action, we just stop this talking and we gotta get out there and do our thing. I mean, we we got people in this room like me, seven years old. We done heard that movie before. <laughs> Been hearing that in the 1960s and 1970s, whatever. You gotta think before you act. Don't ever, don't ever demean thinking. Don't ever do that. 
Caucasians digging now. Got people have to think 24 7 about how to maintain our condition 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now. And we have to think we can just go up and muscle mind an institution. Don't forget everything garbage taught us. <laughs> you know, you know. So I'm saying it's this kind of thing. We get emotionally and get all, you know, whatever. And I've, I've been through that. I was, you know, in the 60s. You know, so we get, you know, you know, we get after, you know, I all, you know, after we, you know, simplify everything, oversimplify it and what have you. But if you lucky and live long enough, or whatever, and you begin to see this thing is complex, y'all. Yes. It gave me pause when I, maybe when I turned about 65, but definitely when I turned 70. But it gave me pause when I realized we're not going to solve this thing in my generation. Mm. And that was hard for me to, because I've been working like, you know, I've been working like, we're going to solve it. I just keep working hard, just keep getting up. We gonna be, before I take my last breath, this is going to be straight. And I'm going to be able to say, okay, my people, I can buy out. We got this thing. You know, but this thing is complex. It's deep. As I'm going to continue to convey to you, this thing is deep. One generation, not just, I've been better thinkers and creative thinkers and warriors than us. Our generation. There were some tough days in that generation before us and some tougher ones in the generation before that. So we're not the first black people to come along and, you know, it's like in the 60s, we used to say our parents were reactionaries and all this kind of stuff, you know, and whatever. If they weren't working for the white people, we couldn't afford to go out and protest against the white people. So it was a what? It was a team thing. But we're going to say the parents are irrelevant. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a shallow analysis. It was a shallow now, so we're gonna call our own parents Uncle Tom. Mm -hmm. You know, and Aunt Jane. You know, because they go watch the clothes of the white people, so we can go try to burn their damn house down that night. And whatever. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But they think, no, we all gotta go up in the front yard, and they got every tank in the world and said, damn you white people, whatever, we bad. And we gone. We we been blown off the planet. You know, and they said, Oh, they were a good memory. We, we just live off their memory. That's not how we're gonna win this struggle. But again, that's the power of psychological oppression. We don't want to underestimate. We see this play all the time, you know. So that was just that's just that's just a bad presentation about how we confront this situation. That we this is an intergenerational struggle. So we got to do what we're supposed to do in our generation. So the next generation don't have to repeat this stuff. They can keep building and get closer to this liberation. But if we gonna be around here and be foolish and impatient and say, oh, we got to do it in my generation, then we are not going to do what we're supposed to do to build this house. You see? Our job may not be to put the roof on, but let's build a strong foundation, a strong middle, middle section of it, so that the next team that comes in, you know, the next wave, you know, can move on. I think when we see it that way, we can use our energies much, much better. You know, it takes, a, takes some of that tension out. You know, you can start, you know, okay, we're just a long haul, we're in a relay here. So let me make sure I get that baton to the group coming behind me in a timely fashion with as much speed and momentum as I can muster so they can take this thing on. But it took a while. It took a while for me to, for that to, you know, that realization to come to me and say, okay, I've got to change my strategy now. <laughs> We ain't gonna do it <laughs> by, you know, by, by, by whatever, 20, 2020, oh, however long I got, you know, 2025 maybe, maybe I got that long. You know, but I think we're not, but once you realize that, it changes how you approach this thing, you see. Let's not get so, you know, like we can't talk to each other, we can't, we got an argument, we mad at each other, whatever. Well, yeah, this thing is complex. Even what we think we understand may not be told in total. I'm moving away from absolutes, y'all. And I, I was one of the most absolute folks you could ever find. Because it oversimplifies, it makes it convenient. Yeah. But, it, but if you live long enough, you see how complex it is. Yes. Yeah. You know, but now that's like we want to say, wake up, black people, stop acting crazy. Hell, if that would have came, they would have wake up away from without us saying that. <laughs> you know, obviously, they're not asleep because they want to be asleep. <laughs> There are forces out there that are designed to keep them asleep. Let's put them asleep and then keep them asleep. You know, so we got to realize this thing is, this is complex. And I hope that this construct called cosmic orientation conveys to us that we are killing ourselves silently. You know, don't even know it. You know, and just walk like on a death march. You know, and don't even know it. You know, uh, and what happened. You started talking about how all these institutions of the society operate. 
They don't want that. Don't want that to have to make anything. Any people activity, they got control of. They control the messing of it. Trying to be fine. And then march us into it, like going into little gas chambers and so on and so forth. Whether it's education, religion, media, aesthetics, economics, labor production, mental health, medical health, military, law, police, and judicial, all of it, all of it is saturated in white supremacy, domination, racism. I don't care if they, if they, they give you the lethal, lethal dose with a smile on their face. You see? That's the strategy. Dr. Francis West would always say, if follow everything to its logical through, you come back to this white genetic survival. Mm -hmm. This psychosis in the white folk, the white collective, that drives the motivation for everything that they do. And I don't care if they smile and chase it back. It's going to be easy because they're afraid that they can be annihilated by the African people of the world. And then I guess the rest of the melanated folk get in line behind the African people. So they scared of everybody, but they're most afraid of us. And it makes them engage in a crazy construction of reality. And then they maintain it at all costs. By the way, I said it's psychotic. It's a psychopathic personality that these people are operating from. I mean, they can't. I was, I tried to do a, 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 a commemoration of Dr. Francis Wilson in the issue of the Black Child Journal. I don't know if any of you saw that. And last year it came out in December. And I was trying to appeal to our people to appreciate the fact that. We don't have a more reasonable explanation of white supremacist psychology than Dr. Wilson and Dr. Wright. I said reasonable. We don't have a more reasonable one. Now, we got all kinds of folks all over the place. But a more reasonable one. And it shakes us up because what? It steps outside of the construction of Eurocentric reality. See, white folks say everything. It said you ain't shit. You see? But this is how you take your SHIT and create a construction of reality, reconstruction of reality, but then make all of us drink it, eat it, whatever, and smile about it. You see, as, as, as if we're zombies and what have you. And so, and so, and so, but again, but it's, it's hard for us to swallow that deal. When she comes up, we see whites controlling and dominating everything. And she's but these people are really afraid, you know. But if we, if we pay attention to our little psychology class again, we understand. That when you're unconsciously driven by something, your whole lifestyle is a defensive lifestyle. Everything you do is designed to protect that 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 that, that which that's course of that fear, that anxiety, is irrational fear, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So the white people are different. I'm sorry. Can I add something to the discussion? Two things. One is uh, you have uh, epistemology out there, but I don't think we understand the use of language well. Mm -hmm. We need to pay more attention to language, what is being said, what words are being used, and look at word parts because the meaning of what's actually being said or written is in the etymology of the word and word parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, a perfect example, classic world example is everybody in the world says aboriginal. Mm -hmm. But really, the people who are, are in a country who were there before others came are the original people. They are not uh, suffix A-B, original. And the people the world over repeat that over and over. There's some words that we repeat over and over and over that we give power to. And we have to pay attention to that. Let me, let me, let me, let me. I, I made a mistake. I, I should have let you hold it to the end. I got so much I want to cover, and then just, just make a note of what you want to say, and then we'll come back to it. Because what we do, see, I want us to get a, a holistic analysis of oppression. I don't want us to come up with a pick and choose and whatnot. Let me just finish. I don't want to. I don't want us to pick and choose because we want to get the whole picture, and then we can when we attack, it, then we can attack it from those various points. But we want to. But we want to have the context for it, and it, 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 it's challenging because. Most people don't talk about don't talk about oppression as this overall process, this structured process, uh, and that's why we, we we can't we can't we can't we deal with aspects of it. See, we attack aspects of it rather than understanding that that uh, it's, it's going to be it was here when we were born and it's going to be here when we die unless we understand how it really what it would oppose it, you know, and and that the. Uh, let me get some more diagrams. And I really don't want, don't have time to to go through all of that. You can see how it's consistent with it. I use terms like uh, the, uh, 
the European worldview or the European survival thrust, you know, the cumulative adaptive response of that, of the white collective over time, you know, throughout their, their evolution, if you will. And it becomes their, their characteristic way of adapting for approaching their survival, maintaining their survival as a race. And white supremacy domination racism is part of it because they're, 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 they're dying, they're, everything designed is to solidify their, their protection or defense against the, their now, what they consider the annihilation of white. You know, uh, whatever. They want their whole thrust is they want to be able to be white people tomorrow and white people forever. <laughs> that's what they're, that's what they're, they're that's what's driving them. I don't care whatever they say, however they call it, however they dress it up. That's what that's what Dr. Wilson said at the bottom of it. That's what it is. Uh, and we don't understand that because we ain't never dealt with no phenomenon like that. <laughs> you see? And so it's hard for us to come to, to come up a, a, a open response to it. Let, first of all, we got to understand. It. Are these people for real? Are they? I mean, they can't handle being white. See, they can't handle being what they are. And so they have to construct a reality that makes it something imaginary. And then they create a whole quick reality structure around enforcing that imaginary state. Yeah. That they are superior, they are this, they are so on and so forth, so on and so forth. Right. Just a question. Okay. So European survival drugs, AST is African survival drugs. And what's I'm sorry, African self-consciousness. Okay, African self-consciousness. And that's the optimal state of uh, psychological orientation in my, in my uh, paradigm. African self-consciousness, so seeing would be the opposite, the contrast of that. So optimal. And, and what happened. And so we're talking about this, this is the psyche of the, this is the black mind. I'm no pressure. You know, we have this affirmative dimension and this, this uh, destructive dimension. And this destructive dimension is what is being supported by the infrastructure, the societal infrastructure uh, surrounding us and every function here. And I, I would make call this orientation uh, is complex. So you, you're there degrees of it. You can be mentally disoriented, moderately disoriented, or severely disoriented. And of course, you can, you can imagine that it gets worse when you, as you, as you progress from minimally to, to severely, it gets worse. So this is, rel this is a relative better state than this one. You're less contaminated here than you are, than you are here and, and you're here. But we all breathe the air. See, we all breathe the air. But some of us have gotten a little more understanding of it, and so we're putting on a gas mask, you know what I mean? Let's put something on, you know. We know we out here, we know this air is part of this. Let's put something on. We're going to cut down on some of it, you know. And whatever. Uh, let's go into a, a chamber where there's a, you know, we can create our own air flow or whatever, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, at least temporarily. And that kind of thing. So, so but, every, but I'm saying everybody is, you know, I, I don't think there are any, any escapees, you know, in this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think that's one of the things that I think we, we've sort of mis, mis, misunderstood and mis, misrepresented, mm -hmm. you know, in our whole black liberation movement and whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that you know, that's, uh, and in some extent, they decided at one point in our history, sort of reactionary in that sense too, you know. You ain't black enough, so, <laughs> you know, that I'm blacker than you, and, and, that, and that kind of stuff. You know, when all, all of it was defensive. <laughs> it's like in coming out of the covenant's orientation context. Because yeah. we all in the struggle, <laughs> we all, and we all gotta figure, we gotta figure a way out of this thing as a collective uh, uh, in, in that regard. And so, and again, uh, that's why God, I think, was so important. He was trying to institutionalize. See, he said, we're going to be against the We got to institutionalize. You know, all this, I'm the baddest, you know, the black John, the black version of the John Wayne, you know, or whatever. It just, just won't work. I mean, it, it may give you some mini relief, you know, that kind of thing, but it's not going to solve the problem of our people. Uh, and that, because it's not an individual problem. Uh, and these are components of public orientation, like say materialism. And they, it's not, again, it's not limited. It, this can be elaborated upon by future generations of students and whatever who, who are interested in, 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 in furthering this construct. But so materialism is one of the basic orientations of public orientation. We, we see ourselves in the fine things and value things in the basis of physical material identification and identified things on a material dimension. Individualism, uh, the, you know, naive, we know what that means. Alien self orientation, naive. Uh, presented this years ago, uh, promoted this, this notion, and I just took that notion and folded it into the, the cultural orientation because it's clearly, you know, where you just embrace the Eurocentric value as a general principle, you know. Uh, 
and then the anti-self orientation where you attach negativity to that embrace. Now you got a negative energy associated with it, you know, with blackness, with anything that you can see as 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 uh, African or African. Uh, so it's hostile and balanced toward the self, what we call it anti-self orientation. The self-destructive orientation is, you know, you just out there trying to survive and don't know, don't have no 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 parameters, no framework. And so it's like you out in the water swimming and you just splashing around and you you drowning because you you just trying to but you're trying to survive. You're trying to make an affirmative response, but you don't know what, and so you sink. And so it's the drug addicts, the people who who, who poison who kill himself, you know. Uh, right, right, you call it, you know, suicide and all that kind of stuff. You know, you, uh, it's a homicide, you know, black on black homicide is suicide, you know, and uh, at the collective level of our struggle. Uh, and of course, with the integration orientation, you know, uh, this is, you know, you can't do nothing without what? White. You know, either you gotta be with the white, or you gotta imagine the white being there with you, <laughs> imaginary white, you know. You know, somehow you got to, you can't stand without the white. You got to, you start leaning, you start reaching for white. <laughs> oh, yeah. And grab them and pull them to you, you know. And they fight to get away from you. <laughs> it's like the sister said last night, you know, we, you know, tell me we had an APA, you know, over there at the white folks' house, you know, APA, and said, we trying to, we saying, why don't the black people at AP side come on over here? <laughs> you know, it's the wrong damn way around. She got it upside down. <laughs> You know, and that. But it's nothing if they want to be there. I ain't gonna say there's nothing wrong with it because it is something wrong. But if they want to be there, that's fine. But they're looking for they're looking for something that's a fantasy. They have no basis. They have no base, no evidence and basis for anything other than the fact that whites told you, come to us and we give you peace and rest or whatever those <laughs> cliches are. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that kind of thing. And so and so the you know, so that's the integration orientation. And they 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 sold us that. That nothing, you know, white water tastes better than what? Water that don't say white. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, anything. They just, I mean, it's like, it's like the, the kids in a toy, they like, they like, you know, I just hate to use this term because I don't want to, I don't want to attach nothing special to him. But Donald Trump, you know, like, Donald Trump is like a, like a spoiled rich boy. You know, and he get his toys and he want to go and whatever. But he's really the prototype of the, the white and the devil, you know, and that kind of thing. But, but the fact of it is, is that, you know, it's like, it's like this integration thing. I want to tell you that, you know, you, I mean, they, anything. It's like they come up with anything, that, the wildest of their imagination. I mean, you know, white water, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's, that's, kind of, that, that, that's, that's out there. You know, white water. <laughs> Don't you drink, you know, you can't drink our water. You know, white water, you know. And that kind of thing. So you can see where this stuff takes. And Bobby and Francis talk about it all the time. I mean, if they do, if they do crazy shit. And we be trying, we be trying to say, well, why they do? They don't really dislike us, or they don't really, you know, or they, you know, uh, look, see, they invite us to their APA meeting. Or they have a special, what they have a little special racism section in APA. <laughs> so they have, where they, every every so many years they have a conference. Where they have where they, where they, where they highlight. But they highlight racism, you know, in other words, what we've been doing to y'all. But don't but don't say it's us now. <laughs> no, no, we we gonna we go we gonna create the platform. <laughs> Just talk about them other whites, that the other white. I know how that's gonna look for. <laughs> I mean that's the damnest thing. Let me stand right this. Some people say the damnest thing to black people put to their face and don't even blink. <laughs> and say, just say something stupid as hell. You gotta be nuts to believe it. <laughs> this same thing don't even play. And then you get offended if you say, don't fit that phone to the way man. Why are you so you know, you know, that kind of thing. But that's what that's what they do. That's how they be, as you know, as we say. But we won't let white people be white people. That's one thing about our people. We insist. We insist they can't be what you know what what they are, you know, as a collective. We're gonna make them what like us. We gonna do if we take a Dance, certain dance, let's do that dance. You like us now, white people? You know, uh, whatever, turn around, be there. You like us now, white people? Uh, what else? Well, then, then you get exhausted, you go, well, what can we do, white people? You know, to, make you, to make you like us. Because we know deep down inside, you know, you know, like us somewhere in there. And what happened? So we spent all that energy. Look at all that energy. I mean, last night and me, we up there arguing, but we got an associate called Associate of Black Psychology. We talking about, but what are we going to do about white people? What are we going to do about white people? 
Well, we can't have no white people in our church. We resisted for 49 damn years. <laughs> about say, but what about, we vulnerable to the white people. <laughs> I mean, we gonna we we create a basis for hysteria <laughs> over, over a non-existent phenomenon. You know. <laughs> over a non-existent phenomenon. They don't want to be here no way. Yeah. They don't think we doing a damn thing worth anything. And they don't know they pretty much show no we're not mounting no real challenge to their domination. You know. Because primarily what? They train us. <laughs> you know, and they know their training works. Look at how long it's taken us to try to write our shit. And we haven't write it yet. But that's no, that's all right, it's a process. Don't get me wrong, I'm not it's a process. So that's so that's that's uh that, that, that one. But yeah, that's, these are these components of thought disorientation. And I don't know where well, my time is going, but you know, I want some of these young scholars in here to look at this stuff and let's, we're going to talk about a little research, you know, hopefully at the, at, near, the, near the end of this, and, and how we can start studying African Senate constructs. See, we spend a lot of time studying all kind of other constructs. And I'm not saying anything wrong with it because knowledge, you know, just go out there and be, be thinking, be, be thinking creatively. That's what, that's what I will dog you if you don't do that. Now, I'd like to steer you in a certain kind of way in terms of at least some of y'all follow up on the kind of stuff, you know, that we're trying to do here. But don't go sit back and don't use that brain. You know, just sit back and all you do is you get your PhD and then the only right you do is you write a check. <laughs> you know, to, to buy something or whatever. And like you, like you lost your ability to think creatively beyond your little dissertation. That a white person was usually standing over you saying, no, 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 you can't say that. No, 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 you can't do that. Or, no, 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 you whatever. So you finally got a chance to think independently and whatever, you sit up there, don't call your white mentor. You say, what should I say about something that I Am I free to think I'm my own now? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So, so, you know, just, just all of you In the complexes, and it's controversial, you know, everything, everything you do when you confront us about our, you know, our contorted psychology under oppression, it's going to make us uncomfortable. You know, you just may as well Except that, you know, it's going to make us uncomfortable because we've gotten comfortable with crazy, you see. And so when you begin to shine a spotlight on that, it's supposed to make us uncomfortable. At the very least, it's supposed to make us that. And this alien religious thing, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is bringing the black, this is, this, this is, this is one of the great impediments to the liberation of black people. In my opinion, okay, in my opinion, I was in Chicago, I was asked to come to Chicago to give a presentation several years back on uh, psychology, religion, and oppression. And I said, do you really want me to come and give that speech? I said, I, said, I don't know if you really want me to come and give that speech. I said, because I'm, because where I'm coming from, I, I don't think people, you know, they may want to run me out of Chicago, <laughs> you know, and whatever. Uh, because we some, we some psychotic people when it comes to these, these alien religions. They, 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 they hold, I'll tell you, they, they sit like they deep inside of us and, and we just can't, we can't move. I mean, the first thing, the first theological stuff is, we got the image of God as a white man, you know, or a man, you know. I mean, that's the damnedest thing in the world. It makes no sense. Half of the human race is, is female. Now, what God told you? What God, you know, people like to come to people who say they have a nice communication with God, you know. Come say, well, God told me, you know. <laughs> you know, that is penis power in the world, not vagina power, it's penis power. Because you got muscles and whatever, you equate, you know, like a 14 year old analysis, you know, you equate that with, with magic, with brains, and all these other kind of things. And so you walk around, have, have on somebody's word, not based on no history, certainly not on history after the people. It doesn't matter walking around thinking about women are subhuman beings to me. And I used to tell my students, I said, if you see somebody who walk around and say, light is better than dark, I bet you that person is light. <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't got to know nothing else. <laughs> yeah, I bet you that's the source of that, of that proposition. Okay. If you find somebody said tall is better than short, I bet you wasn't a short person saying that. <laughs> see, I bet you no short person. Okay. So you walk around and say, God said men should rule the world or men should be dominant over women. I bet you a man said that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you that came out of I mean, that's common sense. That's just logic. Common, common sense, you see. And yet we'll have half of the half of human race following around something that 
that ain't no ain't justified in no objective reality. <laughs> you see, I call it frontal lobe psychology. Mm -hmm. Everybody got the frontal lobe. <laughs> you know, everybody able to imagine to create future. You know, and whatever that ain't no, they ain't got nothing to do with no, you know, testosterone or estrogen. <laughs> you know what have you? But again, we come get caught up, and I think see, that's at the heart of alien religions. Doctor Doctor John Henry Clark, great, brilliant. African historian. He said, all these alien religions are nothing more than male chauvinist murder cults. Mm. They use God to justify killing people and all that other kind of stuff in brain, and running there and running there and, and suppressing and oppressing everybody else. He called them male chauvinist murder cults. He said, we look out here throughout history, that's, that's what they've been doing. Using God as justification all justification to kill. And when that the men had the power and so on and so forth, everybody over here about that. And whatever. Everybody, you know, it's, a, it's an adage, a historical adage about Africa. But African people never fought no war with God. <laughs> but here come these foreigners and all that. That's the first thing that's leading the charge. My God is God. My <laughs> God is God. And we, we nuts this far right behind, you know, under our cosmic uh, condition. So that's one that, that you know, gets. Get, I'm sure folks say, okay, Kevin Brown, he's going off the deep end, you know, he, whatever. But I'm telling you, cultural misorientation is coming for you. <laughs> you know, it don't make it just go no quarter. It's about loving black people, it's about empowering black people and protecting the sovereignty of black people. And so we got to, we have to consider psychology, we got to deal with this. If we're going to liberate African people, we got to deal with, you can't, you know, I, I used to tell my students in my black psych course, because the first week of class, I ain't going to sick the cows here. We're trying to save black people. So ain't nothing we can't talk about. Ain't nothing we can't tell you. No, 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 you can't talk about nothing. No, ain't nothing. It's open season. It's anything that has to do with the liberation and the survival of African people. Uh, and so we don't have to deal with that. But I, I'm writing a piece on that too. Maybe that well, I mean, that may be my last piece. <laughs> I just did that. You got to go and get out of Dodge. But anyway, they only call the names. You know, define ourselves in the context of our oppression. You know, that uh, and we accept that as normal. All over the world. Well, black people, <laughs> we accept these names of our oppressors, and that's normal. We, we accept it as normal behavior. And that's an implication for what you just said, you see, a minute ago. So we, and, that, and that's, that's dangerous. We, we normalize it. We normalize it, you all. You know, it's, it's so funny in our people. You know, and, and part of it is just we just we just so adapted to the, the foreign condition that we we live and born into and live under. But it's like when you when you when black like when you you introduce somebody introduce their name their African name, and then the black people act like they can't pronounce. They just get they I'm okay, getting just they just they like they got a wrestle with it when they talk. You know what I mean? Just just be stuck with it. And a part of that is psychological defensiveness, deeply rooted and unconscious. You know, people in your own family. Now, what's your name again? <laughs> you know, we just need to unnerve them because that's, that's been normalized as much as religion. That's been normalized among the oppressed, you know, black people in the world. And if we're going to be psychologists talking about liberating our people and uncovering uncover the condition of our oppression, then we, gotta, we can't have no, we can't touch that. We can't talk about that. You know, they talk about, we talk about my God. Now we're talking about you adopting somebody else's definition of God because you won't acknowledge the fact that you've been oppressed. <laughs> you see? And that's how and that's, and, and, and you take, and that has been psychological at the time. The color complex. Of course, we all, everybody can deal with that. You know. The color complex. That is one of the artifacts of white supremacy domination all over the globe. When they leave, they leave. That's, that's the lingering effect. They leave. Everywhere, everywhere they leave. You know. The folks who are left, now they got to battle over who's the best, who's the best, based on that same, same, same principle. That white is the best and whatever. So we got to hear about it. Not, they, maybe not, they don't have the money and the resources like Michael Jackson, so they can't do all that, but half of the people want it. Should I, should I try to change? You know, I use one example. <laughs> you know, I, I, and some of these could probably be linked together because they're all about self-presentation, but this one, is, this one is just so, you know, it's so salient. It's so salient as a, as a trait that we have to, we should separate it out, you know. And the whites just did so much work on that, you know, with the Milano hypothesis, you know. They tell you, you just got a little bit of us and you, you better than somebody who don't have none. You know? 
and you got a little bit more, you better. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? that that's, 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 that's as crazy as that other stuff about the water thing. You know? And then they can't even measure, but they just come up with a conceptual scheme for measuring. <laughs> if your mama is black and your dad is white, then you will call you a what? Mulatto or something. If, you, if your grandmama is, is white and you, you know, they call you something else. And you, you know, they go on, they create a whole, you know, taxonomy about this crazy stuff. You know what? There we are. We may oppose the law. We go around, like in historic Louisiana, and refer to our stuff on, ourselves on this basis. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And re relate our, our whole social policy relates to this kind of stuff. And look at the island. You, have, you get hard pressed to get our people on the island to acknowledge this stuff. Like they were, in, they were enslaved like the rest of us in the Western Hemisphere. And the same thing is there. You know? Got these situations where you got people in charge and there's a color scheme. You know, we call it colorocracy. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's a part of this very this colorism thing. So they left it all over the place. But we we can't even confront it. See, we we so we we so neurotic kind of thing. We so nervous about. You know, it's almost like something we, we are dressing ourselves in public or something. And, you know, we just get to, so we get so defensive we can't even talk about it. You know, see that's the thing. If we're gonna dress, if we're gonna liberate ourselves, then we gotta look at the contorted self that this old person has created. You know, and that's, that takes courage, right, right there. Yeah. But if we have to look, if we step out of that bubble, then we understand that God ain't gonna leave us, <laughs> you know? Cause the white man, cause the white man lead the room, you know? Oh, that goes God. <laughs> 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 that? But, uh, <clears throat> that's the cult complex, and we all know about it, but then it's then alien self-presentation, that's everything else, the hair, the hair texture, the facial, you know, the facial features and all that kind of stuff. You know, we, we just, you know, like I said, that what oppression, white supremacy oppression got us so tangled up and twisted up that when we try to respond to the expectations of it, it's like black folks, when they get up in the morning, they have to get up four or five hours early. They, get, they gotta spend a couple of hours getting themselves ready to present to the world to make sure, am I all right? And then you gotta test yourself out a few times, look in the mirror, keep asking, and do I look all right? They go out there and face the world. And the white people come out there, they just come and do themselves up and walk on out. <laughs> Take me, here I come, I'm, I'm in charge. The ugly what we ever considered the ugly white people or the lady other kind of white people. You know, they just, um, I can go out, but right before I got to make sure I, I look like some image. And what's the image we got? The white people. That's the one that's through the institutional structure of, of oppression. And so we have to spend all this time. You go to work, you got to get up, you got to get up four hours, and what for two hours, you get ready to go to work. You have to go outside, no, to go outside to go to work. <laughs> all this for human productive time. Put into bullshit. You yeah. impose on us from white supremacy domination. Yeah. Human productive time, creative time, we be dealing with how do we liberate ourselves for them? We are talking about how we don't make white people find ourselves except for the white people. Who don't like it, well, they don't, they don't like it no matter what the hell you look like when you come out the door. <laughs> but you caught up in that fancy, you know, that we you somehow you're gonna, you know, get your allies. <laughs> and the N-word, of course. You know, no matter how we look at it, how we can, the N word is, is self denigration on African people. Because it came from our enemies <laughs> and they pushed it for a reason. It's a part of their toolkit of oppression. In that toolbox. And when they, I mean, when I, was, when I stopped using it when I was young, I, I just had to reason out it. Just, well, as I became more knowledge myself, it just, became no longer a useful construct in my universe. It wasn't had no value in my universe, whatever. Uh, but again, but these things are these things are habitual because they're normalized. And so we do, you know, and, and people who least understand our people, you know, and then we have the young young and angry now, you know, you're talking about the, the young hip hoppers and so on and so forth and, and what they do. I mean y'all, you see, we, we need to understand the reality of oppression. Okay. Oppression is everywhere. We just hoping, we hoping for, you know, we hoping for this, this Marcus Garvey to come rising up. I'm hoping too, you know, but, but I'm saying, 
but we hope it, but everywhere we look around, we 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 we, we, come, we come up with a rationalization. Oh yeah, that's that's the outcome. Because the hip hop will come up and say two words that have some kind of happiness and irrelevance, and the rest of the stuff just down trash and happy people. <laughs> so they have no context, but we don't say, oh, they powerful. They they read it. They what they call them? Conscious rap. That's the you know they they, they got it. And then put out another cut that's, that's just as just as anti-African as you can imagine, and what have you, of the whole hip hop world. You know, I got my own theory about how the what they call the hip hop world that you know the problem with the baggy clothes and whatever. Guess what my theory of oppression is about that? And I don't want to take too too much time, but but I think there are other all kinds of ways to explain phenomena. So I think integration really brought about this that 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 whole phase in our community. You know why? Because when they integrated the schools, the black kids going to school with the white kids. These white kids got all kind of resources and whatever. And they, and white kids, you know, they always been vicious about me, me, this, you know, compa com compare and contrast and all that good stuff. So the rich can come in and say, you know, they got on suits and ties and all kind of jewelry and sort of stuff they own. Black kids wearing hand-me-down clothes, you know, whatever. They in the same context with, with this, look at this contract. But nobody talked to them nothing about no black empowerment. So all they can do is just react and come up with whatever, you know, that, that crew, you know, survival tendency they can come up with. So I you know, guess what happened, you know, when you wear hand-me-down clothes, they didn't have to fit, did they? You wear them and you sometimes have to hold them up or whatever, because they were your big brother's pants or whatever. But when you get to school and the white boy start jabbing you, you beat his ass. <laughs> you, you go accept it. And then whatever, that became a badge of what? That became a badge of macho or whatever, you know, I can wear what I want. But that's all they had to wear. But they made what they had to wear a badge of, you know, that I, that I can back it up. I will back it up. So the oversized clothes, you know, whatever. Because that's what I did, they didn't have it. And the white kids, well, they, they beat them up so much and the black beat them up and intimidate them so much for their own survival daily in that, in that jungle, that war, war psychological jungle dog eat dog, that they, they shine a warrant out. And the white kids start going by and what? Faded jeans. You know, that's why you start making it for you. <laughs> so we'll, we'll sell you this, this whatever, this reaction, everything you want. Because we're going to maintain our control over it. I mean, we used to wear, when I was growing up, you wear the jeans today, they fall off. You know, kind of thing. So they fade. They, you, when they bought them, they were blue. <laughs> you know, they washed them so many times, the scrub or whatever, they started trying to fade it. And by the time I got to be a man, they were selling that shit at JC <laughs> Right off the run. <laughs> You know, sell them. Go pay them first and then sell them to you. See, if you live long enough and you see how oppressed it's going to, you know, it capitalizes on anything. Anything. Because it's about maintaining itself. You know, it's like one of these garbage or whatever. It takes it and then it transforms it back into it to maintain itself. But I believe that's how Boo Boo and all that came about. But it came about out of these. That's my little theory now. I understand. It's just my little. My little psychotic reality. <laughs> but, but, but I think that that, and then all of a sudden it became a phase of bad or whatever. And I think without integration, it probably would have never happened. Because those white kids were vicious. I didn't grow up in that stuff, but I know they were vicious. You know, ah, you don't have this, or you don't have that, and the black kids, I ain't gonna take this every day. I don't wanna go to school, and maybe even change the attitude about school, and whatever. And they couldn't talk about it, but they get one in the corner, so I'll whoop your ass, you say something about my baggy pants again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then the baggy pants became a bad run, walking around with my baggy pants, hands blowing off, and so on and so forth. And faded, and got you know, warm, and they got holes in, you know, in, the, in the knees. See, we wear, that, that was what we wore when I was growing up. You wear up there, they, 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 you can't wear them no more. <laughs> I'm in a family with 10 kids. <laughs> And I'm in the night, so you know I got some hand me down. <laughs> I'm way down the line. <laughs> but my mother did sew me a well, so she tried to sew, you know, fit your mother, hey, fit you, you know, fit you a little better in that regard. But up again, that's just that's just my little my little thought. I share it every now and then with people. And we go around and say, wow, we got something at that dog, something new. <laughs> and it was a reaction to another dimension of our oppression that we somehow looking for a hero or something that comes out of this stuff. That's why it never gets us anywhere. It doesn't fit into the, the larger narrative of black liberation. You see, when we try to make it fit, you know, we just, we just want too hard to fit so bad. And he was good, don't get me wrong. Michael was good. That ain't got nothing to do with their talent, you know. Biggie was good, you know. I don't know with their talent, but did they understand? Did they have the analysis of liberation? 
course they did. Where they get it from? Osmosis? <laughs> you know, the work out here being done to keep them in that state of cost disorientation. And what happened? But again, you know, I'm sure y'all beat up on me on that one and you on that one too. But, uh, but they were, you know, they were, and so everybody tried to explain it. And the Caucasians, they love to go get somebody they know don't know shit. And they'll put the camera right in their face. Now explain, why y'all use that word? Or why do they like the N word? Why they use it? What's that? I must be just, you know, he got up behind it and so on and so forth. Don't go to Bob Williams, no scholar. You know, <laughs> they don't go to, what's his name, with the guys in New York, the Mongo? Uh, he did it. Go to Lord, he did it. <laughs> he did it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and have a whole P. Diddy press conference. <laughs> Like P. Diddy is a scholar, the one who can analyze and tell you. That's what, that's what he has been doing all his life. <laughs> you know, understanding that. I mean, they, they destroyed everything in our community. I mean, that's, that's the whole message of control. There's a, there's a neat reason why every time they give a black a reward, they want to become a role model for more craziness. That's why they put every camera in there. Now tell them, there are no barriers to black people moving in America, are there? And they said, no, boss. You can, if you work hard, you can do it. Look at me, I'm a four-star general. <laughs> you know, and you're the only damn one in the whole 40,000 of them. <laughs> you know, but that was no, no barrier. But again, that's no way. And then the black on black hypersensitivity, you know, the power thing. You know, that we just, we wake up mad. And that's reason. We go to bed mad, wake up mad, probably be sleep mad. <laughs> you know, we wake up, you know, but we don't. We don't have a paradigm to articulate it. See, that's where black psychologists fell short. And of course, I critique that at the end of the presentation. But that's why we fell short. We don't give our people paradigms to explain the very real stuff that we experience. And then when we, when we create the paradigm, we don't know how to promote it so that our people get access to it. You don't have the radio stations talking about that. Every now and then, they did, you give Dr. Wilson a little play. You know, but not the mainstream. You know, the mainstream one that reached all the people. In other words, the one that, that key was crazy. You know, we, in other words, Eurocentrism in the black community. <laughs> in the airwaves. So we wake up and get a dose of Eurocentrism through a black medium. <laughs> you see? And what happened? And then it had the protection of what? Well, some kind of false legitimacy because it's black. You see? And, uh, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and the most magnificent thing that there's not much to say about it. You know, it is. I just show how those models of time, I have no I tell, I have no disagreement with them. I just think they don't stand alone. They really fit within the context of cultural disorientation as a broader rubric for understanding all these lingering effects because cultural disorientation had its birth in oppression, you see? And so therefore, and therefore, but it explains more than just, you know, stress reaction. It explains the whole context of ideation, you see? How we how did we develop the, the psychology in the first place that hunger distress? Um, you know, we debate this about you know how do we what you know the incident the preference this is preference. I'm, I got I'm gonna go to a slide. Uh, you know that you know when I first conceptualized this in the psychology of oppression, I was talking about uh, you know I just used a theoretical distribution of a normal distribution just to make the point. Of that it, there, are different, there are different levels and intensities of cultural disorientation. It's variable. There's, not, there's no, no static condition. So our, uh, theoretically, you would think most of the black people would be in the 8% you know, uh, area of coverage of that. So that would be moderately. And that, was, that was being nice. You know? I was just being theoretical. <laughs> you know? And that would be gone. You know, but just to, just to demonstrate uh, you know, didactic value. But here's the real issue that I'm saying. I think that's what we. It's skewed, you see it's skewed towards severe. Seven to eight percent of us uh, suffer from moderate to severe cultural disorientation. That I believe that's it. And I think it, it's really growing every day. You know, uh, that we just get, I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like, it's, I don't want to pick on Chicago, but it's in the news all the time. It's like, it's like, you know, yeah, black people get killed like it's a war zone. And it is a war. But we don't have no paradigm to explain it. We have no, no psychological paradigm to explain to our people that there's a reason why we are here duking it out of each other. And now we don't even look at the white people. <laughs> we, just <don't. laughs> we just shoot, find somebody to shoot, and there's another black person, or what have you. And uh, so it's a, but it's just, it's, it, just, it just undermines the quality of life in the black community. And we don't even recognize it, you know, the source of this problem uh, in terms of public orientation. 
So in terms of the, the heuristic value of it, in terms of research, and then real quickly, I don't want to stay on this too long, but real quickly, oh, I'm on Eastern time. I'm really late. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, it should be probably related to any kind of anti-black ideations or symbolism. The Encolpus orientation should be probably correlated to that. Uh, like African self conscious or black nationalist ideology or whatever. You should, there should be a, a negative correlation because Encolpus orientation contrasts with that. It is counter, counter uh, anything, or frankly, counter any black empowerment. Uh, it, 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 it grew out of the process of disempowering African people. So we should expect somebody who who's who's uh, embracing a black nationalist ideology to be to be less focus oriented than somebody who's not. Okay. Uh, in that regard, so that should be a negative correlation there. It should also the CM should be positive, negatively and positively related to pro-black ideation based upon on what it is. And it should also uh, Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. So, but it should be, but colorism, for example, you know, colorism, that should be a, a positive relationship between that inward use. It should be a positive relationship between cultural orientation and that anything that's disempowering for black, we'd expect cultural orientation to be high in that population, or relatively speak in that population. Uh, the, uh, and there should be some, 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 some conditions Social and environmental conditions that breed cultural orientation that are supportive of it, you know, uh, and so we should be able to identify those. As scientists, you know, when we look at, you know, how might we assess this phenomenon and, and what populations might we assess, and what and what uh, sampling uh, context might we assess. Uh, and that's some research that's been done through the years. My students and I and, and others who have, you know, taken up the banner, you know, and and and, and dealt with this and looking at. Primarily uh, looking at uh, constant reliability, construct validity of the instruments uh, called the Cultural Orientation Scale. I didn't mention that, but we developed this paper pencil assessment of it, and I'll say a little bit more about. You know, I think that at some point we got to really look at other ways of assessing, you know, these African phenomena. You know, we got we got computer technology now, so we can we can use symbolism and other ways of creating stimuli that and see if those, those, those stimuli pull on any of these, these cognitive uh, factors in, in, in African people. Uh, I always, I, I, through the years, I, 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 I discovered, I came to the realization that the, it's, it's difficult to, to assess uh, African-centered constructs because they are so emotionally loaded, they're so politically loaded, and so they, they challenge, you know, uh, this uh, social approval kind of phenomenon. You know, they, they challenge that, you know, everybody trying to be politically direct, you know, when you, if you can see it, if they have a, you know, some kind of face validity and you see, you know, that, then you're gonna get defensive. Cause we're all defensive on the oppression. You know, we, we looking for, we looking for any signal to say, oh, let's tighten up close ranks, tighten up psychologically, what have you. And so, so we certainly always have to make an assessment of desire, social desirability and so on and so forth when we're assessing these things. But we also, you know, the classic construct validity, you know, like the anxiety, you know, the tail of manifest anxiety, where you, you target a population where you know that construct should exist. See, all we try to do is see if these constructs have any validity in the real world of African people. And so let's, first of all, let's go out, let's see if we can find these targeted samples. You see, we just want to see if the construct has any utility you know, in, in predicting those things. So, so we need to use our networks. We got networks, you know, we never use AB Sci to the degree that we should, because we're all over the country. So, like, none of could get access to a sample that I would probably have a little more difficult to get access to being in FAMU, and she's in Ohio State. So we're collaborating, you see, we, we can get, she might get what she needs, I get what I need, you know, that kind of thing. And we, but so we got access to these, these sampling pools and whatever, so we can target, because the first thing we gotta do, we gotta, we got to get a, give these, these constructs a fair hearing in the real world before we start dispensing saying, oh, they're, not, they're useless and whatever. When they got it, they're going up against this whole political reality of, you know, of oppression and, and, and uh, social desirability and all those things that our, that our sampling is so, you know, psychologically charged to defend themselves against, you know, and protect. So, so, and so, we, but we can use the cyber world now. You know, there are other kind of ways that we can do assessment, and we got. And I thought that at uh, 
Tony, Tony Jackson's presentation the other day, I don't know how many of you all were there, but it was great. Uh, because it began to open up this whole dimension of relationships that we need to look at. How do we integrate these constructs into the whole body of African people, you see? And look at it on all these different levels, the bowel, neuro, neuropsychological level, you know. Out not only just the behavioral and, and, the, and the ideological or the psychological level, but also look at the, the biochemical correlates of these phenomena. I always, I always believe that, that if, if they really want to, want to, uh, to study this uh, racial disposition in these policemen, all they need to do is do some neuro, you know, some neurobiological assessments of them. See, in other words, they can't hide those things. If you know how to set that up, and you can predict these dispositions. Like, I, 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 I just concocted up, I, I, that's some time ago I concocted up, but I just met one thing would be a telltale. If you have some flashcards on a, you know, on a computer, that, you know, then yeah. And you, then you set it up and you just flash a black infant, then a white infant. You know what, I mean, the baby just born. And, and you got them hooked up. I bet you're gonna get some different bowel feedback from them and that. And it's gonna be predicting something. You up there asking about it. Do you like black people? Of course I like black people. <laughs> or do you, would you ever shoot them? Of course I wouldn't, you know? That's what you're gonna get there. But let's hook them up. Let's see if there's any correlation between, and of course I won't, and what they really say. You know, all, all that GSR. You know, the same way they feel when they get that lynch bar out, whatever. That kind of thing. But that, but it, but it begins, so we gotta integrate this. So we, you know, we gotta get access to the technology. Tony and them got access to the technology. See, and I think we all need to be trying to connect with them and get, how do we find, get access to that kind of technology so that we can integrate that into this, this African Center of Analysis. Because uh, the sampling is critical if we're just going to find out if the, if the constructs have usability in the real world of African people before we jump out there and dispense with them and say, they yeah, right. But we can't even test them adequately, you know, unless we have access to the kind of machine toolbox, you know, that they have that Harvard and Stanford and, you know, where they stole all our money in the first place. And, and, that kind of thing. and then tell us, well, that stuff you're studying, oh, I don't think that's. You know, that's really not salient in the field today, you know, and I'll give you all that. You know, man. We gonna keep you keep you underfoot. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. I'll come to APA, we'll let you study it there. <laughs> we'll give you the, the findings, you know, engage in that there. Uh prevention you and all my work I talk about how we we gotta create institutions to heal ourselves. You know, this, I'm not, I'm not against, but believe me, I don't throw nothing, I don't throw no babies out with the wash water. I'm not against no individual therapy and all that, let's do everything. There, there, there are a thousand ways to skin a cat. <laughs> I have learned, as I'm going to, ain't there no one way. So let's, let's, let's do something, so that's not just, that, but, but I think that we all have to create institutional structures if we're going to really fight back, you know, and, and I think that, uh, you know, again, we always have Marcus Garvey as our, as our great, you know, great leader in, in raising that clarion call, that institutional structures. Uh, and, uh, now I will, let me just mention one other thing. I, I've got to mention this. I know my time is running, and I'm going to have some QA. But in, in 2013, you all know about the Bobby Wright Community Mental Health Center in Chicago, right? Anybody from Chicago? The Bobby Wright Community. Okay, I can just add wild in. <laughs> But, uh, beat up, beat up on. but the Barbara Wright Community Mental Health Center in Chicago was uh, one of the two freestanding comprehensive community mental health centers in the country in the, late, in the early 1970s that were predominantly black. And one was Garfield Park, that's now named the Bobby E. Wright Comprehensive Community Mental Health Center. And Bobby, as you all heard about him, Bobby was, Bobby was about the purest Pan-African nationalist we ever had at A.B. South. And he was president black at the time he died, and I, you know, had a special election I ran and, 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 and took office uh, in, his, in his absence. But, but he, he opened his mental health center, and y'all, he transformed that place. I worked there before Bobby, and then I came back and worked for him. Bobby turned that thing into a black think tank. This is a mental health center now. I mean, you had, you had never seen a mental health center that looked like a war room, <laughs> fighting in a race war, you know, in the race war room. In other words, if you knew Bobby, it wouldn't shock you that he would try to do something like that in a, you know, a, a standardized institution. 
Because there was no other mental health center, none of that. You walked into the conference room, they got, he got all these pockets of white supremacy. You know, like a map, like these war maps. And when they got them all isolated, you know, identified up there. Where the Ku Klux Klan, where they saturated, where the white nationalist council of white, they got them all up there on the board. You know, in a mental health center. You walk in there, red, black, and green. <laughs> and Brent got a grant to reap, because when I was working there before, Bobby, you know, you had to go in the basement on the summer on a hot day, you had to go in the basement and try to find a fan. <laughs> because AC wasn't working there for the time. But we got a whole new, I mean, eight, eight central air and everything in there. And not Africanized the place on top of it. You know, I mean, it was, it was amazing what he had done. Uh, if you knew him, you, you know, if anybody going to do it, he could do it. But he had done that. And here I am, I'm going, I go to FAMU then, after working there, go to FAMU and try to create an African Senate, you know, emphasis in the psychology department. Now, Bobby died, unfortunately. And, but look at, can you imagine what might have happened if Bobby had lived? We would have been able to start something in mental health in this country that it never seen for our people. I mean, we, we, we were able to, we would have been able to create some networks you know, the work that Bob was doing, you know. I mean, look at, we had AB side coming of age, you know, without, I mean, but we, we would have a place where you actually practice psychology. See, that's what's powerful. You get the, the, the psychology department where you create constructs and theory and whatever, now you've got a, a place to demonstrate, you know, in the community. And how we could have spread that, created models and spread that. It's amazing. I went back in 20, 2013 for some kind of commemorative, commem I don't know, 30, 40 year commemoration or whatever. And they, I got a chance to speak. They had never invited me back there since Bobby died. Mm -hmm. And I cussed them out when I got a chance to speak. <laughs> I told them, how dare them do that to this institute, still bearing his name. Mm -hmm. And they don't let it go into ruin. Mm -hmm. Here I was building this African Center bridge down in Florida and him. And they got this institution that still bears, you know, that still bears his spirit. Mm -hmm. And they lose it. We, they made us lose this opportunity. We don't know what this window would have offered us. Come out there. You just now. You just living off his name. You know. Ain't doing a damn thing else. You're not helping our people get sick. You ain't doing nothing to, to, to eliminate, to li alleviate anything, and what have you. So you know, it's just a. It was just. It's just a. You know, we we have these 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 windows of opportunity, and we can't. You know, we don't want to miss that kind of thing. You know, when we're when we out here in the struggle, because you know, the resources are limited when we out here working in isolation, you know, and not having institutions. But it just, I just wanted to mention that, you know, it was just, in the 1980 paper where I wrote where I, where I was a Western Regional Representative when I was in Denver, uh, at the Western Regional Conference, second Western Regional Conference. Now, Tom Hill was still alive then, uh, Ace's brother, young brother. And, and we, we came to, they came to Denver. And I gave this speech called The Role of Black Psychologists in African Liberation in 1980. And of course, I cussed black psychologists out in that paper because of the fact that I said, here we are, you're not, I mean, we're up here working for the oppressor, you know, rather than working to liberate our people. We co we letting them co-opt us. We get these degrees and we go out and try to practice all this Eurocentric stuff in our community. Like Bobby's always said, you can't apply white definitions to, to black behavior and think you're going to come up with something. You know, he just kept it simple, you know. The black white stuff, right? You know, the term and whatever. But the point of this is that it uh, challenges them, and I think this field is applicable today to argument. I talked about how we, how we, we get, we're so Eurocentric in our theories, we're so Eurocentric in our, in our, in our research, we're so Eurocentric in our, in our professional development. We're trying to, we're still struggling, AB side, trying to keep AB, a, APA off of AB side, you know? And still trying to find who we are. We inclusive? Are we exclusive and that kind of thing? And maybe so we still got nothing. Now I'm not criticizing. I'm, I am criticizing, but I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. I want to encourage us. You know, it, it's a process. It is a process, and I respect that. You know, I appreciate that I eventually had to succumb to admitting that it's a process. So you have to step back with that. You can criticize, but don't beat us down. You know, because we can't get back up. Because we, we, we all in the same boat, you know, what have you. But, but again, and in the family psych department, what we've been trying to do with the curriculum there to, 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 um, to develop this African-centered paradigms and to develop an African-centered support network for mentoring and, and training. I'm sure we, we, we may have, I don't know, I don't want to get bold and baggy, 
we have a large contingent here at this convention. I, I won't say we have the largest contingent, but we do have a large contingent here at this convention. Uh, and finally, then I do you know, Howard some props and Virginia State University some props. They're doing some things at Virginia State that I'm really excited about. Dr. Reginald Hopkins, Brother Quay Koo, he's the chair of the department there, standing back there in the blue guy shaky. And, uh, and he's a former fam human. <laughs> And, uh, and we got uh, Kirk here is here, and Derek here. So we got a real place around the country where we, you know, this seed that we plant, you know, and it takes a while. He's getting to Kirk to go to Don Kirkman. A couple of Don is here. Uh, North Carolina Central University, Southern University, North Carolina A&T, uh, Clark Atlanta University Center, Moore House, Prairie View. You know, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle because you know, we deal against we deal, we we move against cultural disorientation. It's everywhere, <laughs> and certainly interested in these psychology departments and whatever. But uh, they're going to exist, and we're going to make them do something. <laughs> they don't let them sit there like a knot on a log, you know. And we not and we not challenge them to be something. Them, you can be challenged, and the rest of them can be challenged, you know, and whatever. And uh, finally, you know, we just gotta. You know, it, it, it speaks for itself. That's what I've been saying. You know, all over there. We, what the what the overall significance of this paradigm is? It challenges us. It confronts us. You know, so we can't be we can't go to sleep. We got to be busy, intellectually busy. We got to be creative, intellectually creative. If we're going to respond to this this overwhelming condition of cultural disorientation in our community, and we've got to see white people in the way that they are. We can't, you know, we can't invent this role, this delusion, this delusional conception of white people. And we ain't about no hating on white people. We shouldn't have time to be hating on nobody. Because that's just absorbed good energy that we can be used to defend ourselves against white people. You see? That's what we need that energy for in that, in that regard. Because uh, I don't know of any way yet that we're going to be occupying this universe in their absence. So we got to, as Bobby said years ago, we got to figure out some way to deal with them, <laughs> you know. And the first thing we got to do is to preserve, define, preserve, and protect our sovereignty. <laughs> then we can deal with them. But we can't. We can't just go out here shotgun and we're gonna go run to you know integration, run to the right thing, run to the way. No, we gotta come together. Then we go deal with the right thing. And that's what the Cultural Orientation Paradigm is about. Well, that's it for your attention. Let's, let's have a little exchange for the last few minutes. You know, you can... You know, it's a, I'm really trying to integrate Dr. Wilson, Dr. Wright, and uh, a few other, uh, just a handful of others who's tried to challenge and take on this issue of, what is this we're dealing with psychologically? What are we dealing with here? What are the critical parameters for defining how, what motivates them? Dr. Wilson has laid that out for them. I can't improve upon that, but I want to put clothes on it. I want to, I want to, so we can see it. We can see it clearly. When it's coming, because we deal with it every day in all its various strategic forms, you see. And so, well, so we need to, to know that. So it's uh, that between that one and the Lynn Johnson thing, they'll probably be my last piece. I, within a four year frame, I'm, 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 and, and I'll probably be faster because now that I got this one, about, about then I can, I, can, I can move on those with, with full, full speed. So, uh, so but that, that's going to be my tribute to Francis and Bobby. You know, I just think that they were, they're like Marcus in, in the broadest, he's the broadest representative in psychology. They're the ones who's trying to stay the course. They said, we got to understand these people. You just can't emote and jump up and say, they're the devil or they're the this and that, that, and that's going to solve the problem. <laughs> you know? And then the two minutes later, we're up there trying to let, can we work together? Can we do this? Or can y'all help me do this to black for black people and so on? And they say, oh, yes, I want to come to the black community and help and so on and so forth. Yeah. They, you know, they, that means we ain't got no paradigm for understanding. Because it comes, it changes like the weather. <laughs> no, 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 we need a paradigm. You know, that, that uh, it's, because they, they, they kill more black people, more black people get killed as a result of either directly or indirectly, white supremacy, domination, racism, than, than anything else over, over history. 
And that's a, we don't, it's a silent thing that we don't even acknowledge. You know, Jewish Arabia gives a great presentation about how medically we just, they just, we just deteriorate medically as a result of racism and our racism. I mean, it's just, it's, and the evidence is so overwhelming. You just have to say, wow. Just let me. My theory of alcohol psychology does an analysis of a white supremacist mentality. They call it the sub mm -hmm. And then an African citizen, I call it an alcohol And then I get over this like a therapeutic approach to help people who want to shift from the Western sub view to the African citizen. Mm -hmm. And there are actually people here at this conference who have been for years about its impact on uh, the people they see in their communities on health centers. Mm -hmm. So it's not true that we haven't addressed the roots of that pathology and developed um, strategies and psychoeducational, psychological, therapeutic approaches to help heal our people from that cultural disorientation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Somebody, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to share that um, some years ago, actually, uh, I did an empirical study. It's in a, it's in a book. It's called. Uh, a new perspective on race and color. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the uh, thesis that to try to figure out what it what do black folks mean to the white psyche? What do oh, we what do we yeah what do we mean? What do we represent? Okay, I got you. Okay. And I did a, a comprehensive uh, empirical study. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting things that came out of that was that um, what black folks seem to represent to the white psyche is fear of the nature of the unconscious, the unconscious part of themselves. That when they fear the, un the nature of the unconscious part of themselves, which they interpret as a dark, unknown part of themselves, it gets projected out onto the black race. And so um, they represent themselves the conscious part, mm -hmm. and for black race for them represented the unconscious part of themselves that they actually fear. And that was the thesis. And I wanted to find out whether or not they had any validity. And it turns out that yes it did. And one of the trigger things that was at play Interesting enough, because you mentioned this, and this empirical evidence that I came up with, had to do with uh, fear of the nature of death, or fear of annihilation of their consciousness. And that was surprising to me, because I didn't expect them to confine them. But that's what came up, that the predominant kind of trigger for a variety of associative thought patterns had to do with uh, the nature of death, which they interpreted as a dark unknown. And that's what people were reacting to. That stuff inside of themselves that gets projected out, and then systems that created you know, the result of all this. But I just wanted to share that. It, the book is out, it came out in 1997. OK, OK. So this is part day. And that's some, that's some symbolic compliment to Francis's model. Right. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I was interested in the distribution of the book throughout the book. And I was wondering if you could talk about the distribution of the book throughout the book. And then also the distribution of the book throughout the book. So I was interested in the distribution, local focal misorientation, high focal misorientation. We have a graph there that shows the percentage to the left. I wonder if you looked at that graph and what the different socioeconomic levels and looked at it. We haven't seen that trend yet in the data, however. We haven't had those extremes. <laughs> you see, we're talking about you're talking about wealth. You see, you're talking about, and I think that we probably would get. I mean, if we if we can take these constructs off the campus and get out into the real world, of course, you know, I think we get much more uh, 
a greater, a richer availability. You know, you the building back there. Say that again. Well, but, but the data doesn't the, the data doesn't support that either. But again, we don't have this. We're not out in the community where you get to rearrange. You got a you got a more uh, homogeneous sampling when you talk about college students. So you you just don't get a, a true sense of variability. So that's something that we can go. But I suspect that is not true. And the data suggests that you know this. I think that's one of this these myths we have that if you're poor, or closer to struggle or whatever, somehow you are you would add it, but, but they, they come after the messaging, have everybody. And, and now you can be poor and have a, you know, one of these, uh, what it, you know, you got one of these and, and they come for you. They come for you on a regular basis. <laughs> I mean, they get to you on a, but I'm just saying, you know, that, that we still have to confront in that regard. I agree. Oh, I agree with you. I agree. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for this set, uh, for giving us this knowledge that we can hold yes. on to. What uh, occurs to me is the universal nature of the cultural disorientation mm -hmm. that doesn't just exist in the United States, right. Mm -hmm. it's all over the world, right. including in Africa. Mm -hmm. right. um, and, so, and so this is very rich because we can apply the, the levels. Mm -hmm. And what dawns on me here is that family, how much you are embedded in your family tree and they're telling you and giving you the gems of knowledge, you know, is going to trench you in, in a strong foundation for a, a less cultural, mm -hmm. uh, what did you call, less severe mm -hmm. cultural right. disorientation. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that I did with your uh, with your work was look at, I, take, I took African American women to Africa, where cultural disorientation is prevalent. However, there are clues in the environment, clues in the culture that we can pull out and we, it reflects ourselves in terms of who we are. And I believe that that was a kind of a jolt that occurred for people to change, to think in terms of African-centered uh, awareness. And I just want to know what your thoughts are about that. Well, I would think in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in an indigenous environment, global indigenous environment, that I would expect there are going to be many more symbolic pools, you know, that are sort of uh, embedded in, in the environment that can pull up on the, you know, the unconscious, subconscious, and what have you in terms of African self-consciousness. In terms of that, to counter, to counter that, you know, the cultural disorientation. So I would expect that to be the case, you know. But again, we know that colonialism, you know, is the same thing as, as white supremacist domination, this global, global, gold crime, you know, and what have you. And so, uh, and Malcolm used to say that all the time. He said, uh, you know, whether it's in Mississippi, or whatever, the same man, same <laughs> the white man, the same, the same. So the source, he was saying, the source is the same. So why, why would you expect to get something, you know, some different outcome when the source is the same? And it's working. <laughs> it's working, you know, and what have you. So absolutely. But yeah, these are things I would hope that young, as I said, younger, younger scholars and whatever, would, you know, who are, who are intrigued by this. You know, I don't own it. You know, I'm just throwing it out here. You know, grab this thing and run with it and see what it says to us. See what it... See what we can, how does it conform to the reality that black people experience? We've just been talking how possible about that reality in theory. You know, but now let's go out here and, and, and see, you know, if we can, you know, confirm or, you know, uh, go back and revamp, you know, go back to the drawing board with it, what have you. But at least we're looking at something that has some implications for our, it was, it was conceived out of our oppression, so it, so it responds to that, you know, and so we're, we're going to be making inroads in that one way or another.